two, and it's part two tonight of our conversation with Mr. Herbert Dorsey. And if you were with us last night, you'll know that this is a man who has much to say about many things. So many things, it's, uh, it's really overwhelming. Went to the same university that I did, uh, UC Santa Barbara, got his degree in electrical engineering, told us some remarkable stories about what is commonly referred to as free energy last night. So listen to that in the archives. It's, uh, it's, it's quite, a, quite a program, to put it mildly. We have been for some time, through the good graces of Frank Chile, who has arranged this, uh, along with George Filer, to have William Tompkins on. And Bill Tompkins is, I think he's 92 uh, was throughout the 1940s and 50s and 60s and 70s involved at the deepest levels of think tanks and advanced aerospace. And we have been with Bill Tompkins revealing, uh, in his view, the fact that we have had for a long time a very well-developed advanced technology space exploration and patrol program called S- Solar Warden. It's to protect the planet and all kinds of things. We've been to Mars, we've been to the moon, we've been all over the place. This is the biggest secret, probably right after the one that we're not alone in the universe at all. We're not alone in this galaxy at all. And I just had a note uh, from Frank Chile who mentions that there are 300 quadrillion terrestrial type planets out there. And Add that to the fact that there are 50 quadrillion galaxies in the known part of the universe. And you get the idea that saying we're, we're alone and no one's figured out how to travel great distances in short periods of time is, is really pretty silly. And the evidence, of course, that we are not only being visited is overwhelming, and the evidence that we are out there deployed on our own advanced space flight spaceship technology uh, is growing all the time. And Herbert Dorsey has much to say about that. So I should remind you that Bill Tompkins will be back with us later on uh, in the end of May on the 31st. It's about as much of the end of May as you can get. But Bill will be back for two hours that night. Herbert Dorsey joins us again right now from Hawaii. Hello, Herbert. Welcome back. Thank you for being here. How are you doing there? I'm I'm good, Uh, thank you. Good. Okay. Okay. well, I, I guess you want to talk about the secret space program. Uh, I'm, I'm ready. Tonight. I'm buckled up and ready to go. Well, um, I learned way right back in 1979 that uh, anti-gravity was invented a long time ago. Uh, it was invented by a fellow named Thompson, T. Thompson Brown. And uh, I picked up a book when I was at the ARE, or the Edgar Casey Library in Virginia Beach. The title of the book was Ether Technology, A Rational Approach to Gravity Control by a uh, author who called himself Rose Sigma. That's not his real name. That was his pen name. Mm -hmm. Uh, Anyway, um, then I went back to college and found out that uh, they weren't talking about this stuff at college. You know, there seemed to be a big black hole when it comes to electrogravitational theory, mm-hmm. even though the stuff was invented back in 1924. So, um, and then more recently, I've been doing a lot of research into uh, the German uh, UFO programs, and um, the Germans developed their own flying saucers. And as uh, William Tompkins has, has said, the, uh, they also entered into treaties with the Draco reptilians, and the Dracos gave them flying saucers, completely built. And uh, so uh, Germany during World War II had um, not only flying saucers that were invented by secret societies as early as 1924, they had operational flying saucers, but they kept the secret from the German people. But they also had completely built ones given them to them by extraterrestrial races. Um, so anyway... Um, I uh, used to go to UFO conferences back in the 1990s, and I met an interesting uh, researcher from um, Bulgaria. His name was Vladimir Terzersky, and he was showing uh, us uh, VHS videos of German flying saucers. There were still pictures and also video pictures that he had 
of these things uh, sitting on the ground and also flying. Um, and um, I got to know Vladimir Terzarsky pretty good. I, I got to meet with him uh, at least five different times in Los Angeles, uh, Sedona, Arizona. Mm-hmm. Um, now, he did a number of conferences in Sedona. And one conference, uh, the last one he did there, was with Helga Morrow and Alfred Bielek. And uh, Helga Morrow and, and um, Alfred Bielek were all sitting in the back room waiting for all the, the people to show up to conference, and they never showed. So we were sitting there for a couple hours talking and discussing all the different issues. And, of course, Alfred Bielek was a survivor of the Philadelphia experiment. Uh-huh. And um, he gave a lot of history on what that was all about and another project called the Montauk Project that he was also involved with. So, um, you know, I got to actually talk with him in person. And Vladimir Terzarsky was operating out of his station wagon. He had his VHS videotapes in his station wagon. <laughs> and mm-hmm. he was actually sleeping in his station wagon. He's really on a shoestring budget. And so... Um, He struck up an immediate friendship with my girlfriend, Zhenya, because they both were speaking in Russian quite quite a bit Mm -hmm. of the time. Mm -hmm. And Zhenya invited him to stay at her guest house in Sedona. So that worked out pretty good. Uh, But anyway, um, uh, me and Vladimir traded a lot of information, and I learned a lot from him on the German uh, flying saucer. May I I ask a question? I don't mean to interrupt, but this is very interesting, because I've seen many photographs of the German craft uh, many of which look very much like the George Adamski craft with the three round orbs on the bottom side, the, the ventral side of the of the disc. And one Correct. wonders if they didn't come from the same manufacturer because they were very, very similar. Al Bielik and, and I, I had Ter- Terzinski on once, I think, on the program, but Al was on several times. What a, what a scene that must have been sitting around. But were those craft the same, in your view? Um. I, I don't uh, claim to know. If you know what I mean. I, you, you know what I mean. But I have seen the, the photographs, and I note the, uh, uh, the similarities. And there's been other authors that have remarked on it also, mm-hmm. other researchers and authors. Right. And there does seem to be, you know, Adam Maskey was talking about tall blondes. Uh, yeah. You know, speaking with them, and they could have been Nordics, they could have been Germans, for all we know. It, but they they didn't seem to have a German accent. Right. But um, you know, that's a possibility. Um, I'm not saying I know definitely, though. Uh, William Tompkins spoke of Nordics in his book uh, selected by extraterrestrials. He spoke of uh, his secretaries uh, who were putting telepathically putting thoughts into his head. Uh huh. Uh, and they would; these thoughts would solve the big problems that they were facing in the Apollo program to put man on the moon. And he would come up with the solutions, but he said they weren't really his ideas. They were placed in his head by these secretaries, who he claims were, were actually Nordics that were working in an office with him, mm-hmm. which I find to be very plausible because I, uh, most of the stories that I've read about extraterrestrials they do use telepathy uh, to a large uh, amount. That was at the Douglas uh, Aircraft uh, Think Tank, I think right. he, was, he was talking. The Advanced Design uh, right. Think Tank. And, and what's amazing that he said is he designed spaceships for the Navy, not, not naval ships in the, that go in the water, but ships that go out in space for the Navy. And some of these were two kilometers long, which I found to be pretty... Uh, uh, amazing. But then if we get back to other whistleblowers um, in the secret space program, uh, um, we have Corey Good, which, of course, is the, the most well-informed of the three that I know of. There was another fellow named Mike Michael Relf, and he um, wrote the Mars records. His wife did, actually, based on his own testimony. Um, and then there was... Um, Randy Kramer. He was in the U.S. Marine Corps Special Services section. And um, all three of these men had to do a 20-year uh, stint in this space program, secret space program. And um, after their 20-year stint was over, they had their memories erased. Mm-hmm. 
they had their bodies rejuvenated by 20 years, and they were sent 20 years back in time to just before they were, or just well, a few days uh, after they were inducted. So it didn't seem like they had, had been in the secret space program at all. They couldn't remember it. They were back to where they started. Wow. <laughs> and, and actually, they were existing on two different timelines uh, simultaneously. They were existing in the, they're up on Mars, and they were also existing on Earth at the same time because they were sent back in time. And um, this has created tremendous psychological stress for these guys being on two different timelines. Mm -hmm. and, and they couldn't completely remember and completely recover from this experience until after 20 years later, after they were back on a single timeline again. And this was brought up by... Uh, uh, Michael Ralph and um, um, the other fellow, I can't think of his name, Randy Kramer. They both had problems until they, they had done their 20 years on, back on this planet again. Mm. And then they were pretty well cured of them. They had a lot of PSTD mm -hmm. because uh, um, Randy Kramer had been a combat uh, role in the Mars Defense Force. He had seen a lot of really violent combat. Oh really? Uh, was, P PTSD. To, That's PTSD. Yeah, he, oh yeah, he suffered from PTSD when he came back. Yeah. And it took him a while to uh, recover his memories. He, he just gradually one of the things that happened and uh, according to his own testimony on this Mars base uh, they, they have military outposts that are separate from the actual colonies. And the military uh, people never see the colonists at all or very rarely. <clears throat> but they, they all stick together in their own military compound. The colonists never return to the planet Earth. They're stuck out there for the rest of their lives. The military people, after 20 years, they can come back. That's the usual way the program works. Huh. Uh, in addition, there are VIPs. And these guys are used what uh, Andrew Basagio talks about, um, the jump room technology in El Segundo, California. They have a uh, in an old Howard Hughes building on Spolwood Boulevard. <clears throat> there was a jump room that they could go into, and it was like a big elevator. <laughs> and they would go inside and push some uh, buttons on it, and suddenly the whole rectangular elevator would would seem like it was twisting into a um, cylinder instead of a rectangle. And they would feel a really gut wrenching thing in the pit of their stomachs, and then it would kind of go away and they'd push another button and the door would open up and they'd come out on Mars. <laughs> that was their own description of, mm. of this jump room technology. So anyway, um, I just, after I just studied all this stuff and everything, uh, I said, my God, I got to write a book about this. So that was my first book uh, on the subject. It was called Secret Science and the Secret Space Program. No, no, my that, that goes anything. back. That goes back about what fifteen, twenty years. That was an early book, wasn't it? The first one. No, 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 no. Uh, well, I have to say that back in uh, Sedona, Arizona, I had done a self-publishing uh, a book. It was called the Secret Space Program. Yeah. But that, yeah, that goes back to about uh, I'd say. Uh, uh, Nine, about about nine, early 90s. Okay, so that's the one I'm thinking about. Now, this one I want to make sure that people understand is a new book, The Secret Space Program, and you can find it under Herbert Dorsey's name on the no, left-hand column. <laughs> wait a minute. The Secret Space Program, that title was an old one I did on my computer and then made Xerox copies and put together in a, a spiral-bound uh, pamphlet. Okay, well, the, the formal and, and title so is story. Secret but Science the, and the Secret Space Program, right? Right. That's right. the one that Amazon uh, sells. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that's the uh, first one was my early attempt at self-publishing, but the, the, the present one is much better, much better um, operation. Right. Um, but anyway, um, as I told you last night, um, I became a free energy researcher after I read John Bandini's books and uh, Thomas Bearden's books, and had actually seen free energy technology. I told you all that last uh, night. Yeah, Dennis Lee. Yeah, Dennis Lee and, and uh, Joseph Newman, 
and uh, <clears throat> Edward Gray. Um, but um, I also learned a lot of other stuff. Like I said, um, uh, some good books to read on uh, the people who want to know what kind of science isn't being taught in our universities. And there's a lot of it that's not being taught. Uh, a good book to read is Gary Velocito's Lost Science. Uh, another one is uh, Gary Velocito's The Secret Weapons of the Cold War. Both of those are very interesting books. Uh, I, you know, I summarize some of my knowledge from those books in the one I wrote. Um, it turns out that Tesla he originally started working with uh, a alternating current, but later his later experiments were with pulsating direct current. <clears throat> he discovered that if you use pulsating direct current of very high voltage, you know, we're talking maybe 10 kilovolts, and um, he was using rotating spark gaps with uh, magnetic quenching, so they would they would be really abrupt um, on and off switching. Uh, he would find out that it would create an ether current. The pulsating DC would create an ether current. Alternating current wouldn't because it would alternate back and forth in polarity. But the pulsating DC would drag the ether along with it. And there was all kind of interesting effects that he would uh, get when that ether current was created. And one of the effects was he could actually feel a stinging on his chest like um, some material particles were hitting him on the chest. But it was, you know, it was the ether that he was actually feeling the blast, sort of like a blast of ether was hitting him. Mm. And he found out that if he um, increased the frequency of this pulsation to a, above 10 kilocycles, the pain would go away, and then he'd feel a warm sensation of heat. And then he would practice, you know, even higher frequencies. And he was getting all kinds of different effects, depending on the frequency of this pulsating DC. Another thing that um, he didn't patent was um, an actually electromagnetic flying machine that didn't work on aerodynamic principles. It worked on uh, electromagnetic principles. And this was using these ether currents to actually propel his craft along. Um, there was another uh, person that, and, and this invention was invented in the 1890s. This is way before the 20th century, I mean, shortly before the 20th century even. Another fellow who discovered anti-gravity was James Worrell Keeley. He was using vibratory physics, and he was able to devise a, a, a levitational machine that would actually levitate. And then he started working on a large-scale ship. And according to my understanding, the, the uh, Department of the War Department of the U.S. military actually tested his ship out, and it, and it did fly. And we're talking about a fairly large one. Well, this is the great airship flap, well, isn't it? Was, it? It was uh, one of the, the ones spotted. Uh -huh. uh, there was a, a thing known as the Sonora Aero Club, that a writer named Dachelle wrote about. Mm -hmm. And apparently uh, they were developing their own uh, flying craft. They looked sort of like dirigibles, but they were much smaller than dirigibles. And they were purported to use uh, a gas called NB gas, which uh, gave them their levitating abilities. Um, but they, were, they couldn't have been helium or hydrogen because they were much too small to lift the amount of weight mm -hmm. involved. Mm -hmm. So there was this big mystery uh, sighting in 19, no, 1897 of airships all over the western United States. There were numerous newspaper articles about them. Right. And, and so there were secret groups that were experimenting with uh, anti-gravity back in the 1890s. 